big thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this process camp. Um, uh, compared to a lot of the people who have been in, in, uh, in the research area or in the practitioner side for many years, uh, my experience and the experience of my organization uh, in this is fairly limited. Uh, so I, I have to be uh, 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 very humble about that. Uh, we are starting to explore use of process mining in some of our client projects. Uh, a quick background, uh, we are a consulting company and our focus is helping our clients improve operational performance through uh, all kinds of levers that can be uh, put to use. Uh, traditionally, this would be called organizational re-engineering, process redesign, uh, improving footprint of your operations, looking at spans and layers, looking at capacity and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and in this domain uh, and in this, with this background, uh, one of the things that we uh, were attempting to do a couple of years ago was bring in more data uh, that is collected uh, in the ERP type systems, workflow systems, uh, that would help us make more informed recommendations to our clients. And then looking for something that would help us do that, we came across process mining and, and uh, in fact started with uh, using that to participate in the last year's business process intelligence challenge and since then we have kind of used it in a, a few different places. So what is the context of what I'm going to talk about? Uh, um, uh, this is what I'm going to share is based on experience with a couple of very large global <coughs> financial services companies. Uh, two very different areas where we have done some work with them on. One is risk management. Uh, especially, specifically loan underwriting for small and medium enterprises. And the second area that we've done some work in is enterprise IT services. And the reason I mention those two process areas specifically is, if you go and talk to owners of these processes in, these, in, in any bank or uh, for enterprise IT services for any large organization, uh, the response you will get is, my process is very unique. Uh, or this is a job shop. You cannot possibly uh, look at data across, you know, 100,000 different process items and, and tell me what's going on. Everything is unique. My people are artists uh, and, and it needs to be dealt with in a unique individual way. You know, that, that, that's the kind of response you get. And it is in that context that, uh, you know, you, you are trying to uh, deploy, uh, deploy this methodology. Usually, uh, when we are uh, engaged, uh, we, we work with a somewhat of a broad mandate saying uh, the question tends to be a little bit ambiguous, saying help us improve the operational performance or help us take costs out. I have a target of reducing cost of this particular function by 10%, 15% next year. Uh, I have done Six Sigma, I have done re-engineering, I, I need to push this forward. So uh, 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 how do we do that? Uh, these are our first two assignments, as I said, you know, this is uh, really, really uh, initial stages for us in using process mining. So uh, we don't know a lot of the do's and don'ts. We have some and, and, and I'd like to share that uh, with you as much as I can. The way we view process mining is uh, our view of what it means to run operations is, is kind of shown on this slide. Um, to us, operations begins with understanding what is it that you're going to work with. So forecasting. How many calls am I going to get? How many applications will I receive? How many times will IT systems break and, and I'll require to deploy level one, level two services and so on. Once I know that, how do I deploy my resources against it? Uh, when do I call people into the office? Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, things such as call center operations, uh, will know the importance of these two activities. And, and in, the, in the processes where you don't have the mindset of, my process is very complex, it is very job shop oriented and not assembly line, uh, when you have the assembly line mindset, you will see a lot of sophistication people deploy in, in forecasting as well as in, in resource planning. Uh, then you execute the process, you have a certain way of dealing with the work items that come in, and you do measurement and control. Uh, we find that process mining can inform all these four areas uh, based on uh, 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 the data that you put in it and how you use that data. 
uh, we heard in both those present both the earlier presentations you have to know the objectives and and, and the purpose of why you are looking at that data different views <coughs> can, uh, look at based on uh, what you're using it for if you're using it for simply improving your process execution uh, there's a certain way to look at it when you're looking at it for helping understand what kinds of work items come in and at what point in time there are parts of the process that you're going to focus on more than uh, more than others and and so on um, and it is in this context that we have used process mining um, and and so it goes without saying that process mining alone will not help you solve the problem in its entirety for understanding where my forecast is going off i need something different for understanding or improving resource deployment in addition to process mining you have to have your traditional uh, resource deployment models and algorithms that you need to build that you need to build and and, and so on um in in the context of the work that we have done usually the problems that we have kind of dealt with are, are of two kinds and this is just based on the two or three examples that i talked about this is by no means an exhaustive list of things that you can uh, uh solve for what is the capacity uh, the, the first question that gets asked is uh, how much work can be done with uh, the existing set of people and how can we re improve resource utilization i see pockets of under utilization i see people sitting idle for periods of time how can we improve that and how can we improve productivity uh, how do we turn things around faster how can we do more with with the same uh, how can i ensure right person is there for the right job so it takes less amount of time or it takes the optimal amount of time and how can we eliminate work without impacting any business outcomes and eliminating work includes rework as well as 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 a set of activities that i do today that i could perhaps eliminate by uh, fixing something else in the organization so uh, the way we kind of uh, have have approached it is uh, and this is a real example from a enterprise it services group of roughly uh, 4 500 people um uh, we looked at uh, two things we looked at um the capacity based on their staffing plans and we validated by looking at attendance records and when i say attendance records i'm not talking about punch cards um we go in and say if you showed up to work you must have executed something on your process flow system you must have shown execute done something that created events in the event log and that's where we use process mining to inform who actually showed up and did real work or did they just show up and not not do as much uh right and 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 it's very very interesting what you find in that right <laughs> huge leakages um and and sorry big brother is watching yeah big brother is absolutely watching now uh, right and and uh and and uh, the other thing is then you look at um how work arrived how much work came in on that day and 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 you see that uh in this particular case because there was a belief that um this is a job shop and and i i need to manage it differently um and 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 my resources are really uh my my prime asset which they usually are and and that is true uh you see that staffing peaks in a nice pattern every week uh and what's going on there is uh there are only three shift patterns being deployed and uh, this is enterprise it services you need 24/7 coverage um people are given three options you take a sunday through thursday shift you work sunday through thursday five days you work monday through friday or you work tuesday to saturday right there is no shift pattern that says you're going to come on on thursday and and friday and saturday and sunday and monday and you know we rotate people who take that shift but that we will ensure coverage in, in that manner what that does is you have overlap of all those three shift patterns monday through thursday mon uh, sunday through thursday sorry monday through friday and tuesday through saturday and you get peaks on tuesday wednesdays and thursdays of the week does the work come in that way no not at all the work comes in when the systems break down whenever something happens to a server or a database uh, or or a network or, or what have you uh, that's when the work comes around and and there is no relationship here in this setup and it was very clear to the manager when you show uh, this kind of a chart that yes people come in uh, uh you know on on a certain shift pattern but our capacity is not aligned to really work arrival so this is a very powerful type of an insight that that you can generate but so we, we this is one of the points that we address uh, right at the beginning when we use uh use this data 
So uh, what is the ideal state? You want to be able to forecast work. You want to be able to deploy uh, resources that are more closely aligned to uh, how the work is happening. So if I go back to that chart, uh, I would like to see that staffing capacity line uh, going somewhat over the green new work arrival line, uh, but matching that very, very closely, uh, accounting for volatility that I have seen in the past. I want to give certain amount of buffer, uh, and I want to ensure that I have the right skills for the different technology areas that are covered in here to deal with highest priority, highest severity events to which I need to respond to within one to three hours kind of a time frame. But, and those consist of roughly three to 5% of my work. So it's not like they, they occupy a lot of what I need to service. Uh, and then you take into account SLAs. A lot of these work items have at, uh, SLA turnaround times of between one and three days. So you take that into account, you let work flow into the next day where, where you need to, and you use that SLA buffer to have uh, somewhat of a smoother uh, staffing pattern uh, exist within your organization. Uh, this is a project that's in flight right now. We're refining this, and we hope that you know we're gonna be able to uh, correct that staffing pattern to get closely aligned to uh, how the work is uh, arriving today. Um, the, the second piece is clearly process understanding. The earlier chart showed you both the capacity and the resource deployment part. Uh, the, so this is kind of the third leg of that uh, four-step four process that I walked through. Um, we use process mining to discover uh, how the process is getting executed. I don't need to dwell on this, uh, on this too much. Uh, you know, uh, clearly the focus is on the red arrows. Why do things go back? Why do they take uh, longer when they uh, are not supposed to take as long? Um, and why does rework occur? So um, the, the, the part where we are pushing on is, can we get to drivers of rework, drivers of delays in a more systematic data-driven manner? Uh, and then what we are doing is we're trying to build um, you know, breakouts like this and, and, and uh, that say, okay, we have 100% of those cases uh, let's study those and let's break those down into certain kinds of root causes. Uh, and, and the way we are getting at these root causes in, in, in two ways. Uh, one is uh, the good old way of select some samples, sit down with process owners and say, out of those 347 items that had reworked, um, you take 10, 15, 20, however many you can possibly do and, and uh, find out what really went on by uh, talking to people who dealt with them. And the reason you need to talk to people is a lot of times that data is not clearly captured in any systematic way. Uh, so you try and do that. And second, once you have got some feel for it, you try and use, uh, and, and if you have access to textual data, comments that people have put in in a workflow system, or uh, if, if there are email exchanges that are attached to the specific work item in your workflow tool, and some workflow tools allow that, you do text mining. And we have done some of that too to get to uh, what the root cause is. So um, uh, then once you've done the root cause analysis, uh, you can also uh, basically uh, go to prioritization of your effort. Uh, and, and I'm showing a chart that we created for uh, the last uh, process intelligence challenge. Uh, especially, uh, this is useful if you know the business impact and, and a quantifiable business impact of a process you are executing. Uh, loan application approval is, is very clear. You can see if the application was approved uh, and accepted by the customer. You want to spend most of your energies on applications that have a high likelihood of approval uh, where the customer is highly likely to accept your offer and eventually be a profitable customer. Uh, if you have the ability to bring that data in when you do process mining, you can say, uh, you know, at any point in time, how much additional effort I'm going to spend on that uh, particular uh, work item. Uh, so in loan applications, for example, a bank will go out and, and, and keep calling the customer to follow up, to get more information, uh, and, and so on. So spend a lot of effort. Uh, what we found in this case was after a certain point in time, no matter how much follow up you did with whatever intentions, it was very, very unlikely that the customer would actually accept any offer that you make to them. So uh, do you want to cut your losses and stop following up at, at day four, day five, day six, 
you, you can draw those thresholds and you may be able to draw those thresholds at different levels for different customer segments. And uh, that's where we use some amount of predictive modeling, some amount of segmentation techniques, uh, other types of data mining tools uh, to say, yes, I have a standardized process, uh, but how much effort do I put on a work item? Uh, can I use the eventual business outcome to uh, make that work better? So those are uh, some of the things uh, that we do uh, just to kind of uh, touch upon the kind of data that we end up working with. This is an example of the uh, uh, IT enterprise services uh, uh, project that we are working on. Uh, we are combining data that is, uh, you know, uh, big brother watching is kind of the feel that you're going to get here. Batch size, when, the, when do people show up to work on any given day? Uh, take out the time that they spent on holidays or, or, or a personal time off, uh, look at their system activity, look at their email activity attached to the workflows, uh, and, and then uh, over to the other side under the CTO specific data, um, you really need to, in most cases, work with more than one workflow systems. Uh, so in, in case of enterprise IT services situation, uh, what we found was different types of work items had different workflow systems associated with them. There are things called incidents. When something breaks down, somebody calls in to say, you know, fix this. Uh, there are changes that you execute. You are upgrading your operating system. You are rolling out Windows 8 or you are rolling out new version of Oracle or SAP or what have you. All those are tracked as changes and they are dealt with in a different system, but a lot of the times by the same people. Uh, and, and that complexity kind of keeps increasing as, as, as you uh, look at this world. Um, so if you want to get a full view of what every single individual is doing in that group, you have to pull data from multiple systems to be able to say, uh, I have captured 100% of someone's activity. And the complexity of that exercise then just, just grows uh, many fold uh, when you are trying to work across multiple systems and, and, and uh, make sense out of that. Uh, what kinds of tools we use, uh, you know, standard data querying things, uh, uh, SQL, MySQL, PostgreSQL, other data extraction interfaces uh, that come with any of the uh, BI tools or any of the ERP systems. Um, then more importantly for analysis, we end up using a variety of tools. Uh, we do do work in R for, for a lot of the statistical modeling. We use scripting in Perl, Python. Uh, for uh, treating data, for uh, dealing with text fields. Uh, we do use uh, uh, SAS, SPSS, CARD, these types of tools for, uh, for analysis when clients need us to be using their, their uh, environment uh, as opposed to ours. And clearly Microsoft Excel. You cannot do any analysis without eventually bringing it to Microsoft Excel. Right? So uh, that's it. Wanted to give a kind of quick flow of flavor within the limited time. Um, happy to take questions. No, no, that, that, that's absolutely, that's a great, great question. And I think the point is, uh, when we are doing this analysis, the point is not to say employees at fault, but the point is to say what outcome are you getting in terms of what people are producing on a day-in, day-out basis. Um, the fact that you have so much more capacity than the work comes in is not an employee's fault. It is a management decision that was taken at some point. Uh, so, you know, that's where it needs to be solved. Uh, when you're looking at process performance, 
when you're looking at rework happening, a lot of the times rework is happening because work items get assigned to the wrong person. And these are being assigned by queue managers who are, who are supposed to be managing these resources, who are supposed to be more knowledgeable, uh, and who are doing also, uh, uh, who are making these mistakes because they have incomplete information uh, when they make those decisions. So when you start going into the root cause, you start looking at how do I change the way I do things at different levels to get my employees to be more productive, right? The idea is not to use that to get on a uh, witch hunt, but to then look back and say, how, how am I managing my resource pool? Uh, and and how, how can I get that to work better? Uh, the other thing that I very deliberately did was, we have taken a detailed process view on this as well. Uh, and, and in our view, you have to come at it from both angles. You have to look at how a process is executed and how an individual's performance comes out uh, because of the way you execute the process and you manage the resource pool. You need to marry both to get to the eventual answer. And I wanted to emphasize the employee part of it uh, when I presented today. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Sure. Uh, right, two, two questions. Uh, one is probably already answered. Where is process mining fit in the whole picture? Uh -huh. And second, I'm interested in what kind of team did you deploy to this kind of project with your client? So what are the size and potentially more important is what is the skill level or seniority? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so uh, to me, process mining is not just drawing process diagrams, but use of the event level data to inform a lot of these decisions, right? So uh, some of it is straightforward, look at the process and understand where the rework is going, understand where waste is happening. And that's where we deploy process mining. When I'm looking at capacity versus work arrival, um, the work arrival needs to be translated into number of hours of work. And the way I get to that is by looking at detailed event data. So, and, 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 and that's where I need to look at a very granular information to say, out of these 100 people, look for the 20 who did something very, very similar for five, 10, 15 days out of the month. Uh, and use that to get to what is a reasonable expectation of a turnaround time for a database connectivity issue fix versus a server reboot versus a hardware fix. And, and that's where the event log data really uh, comes in very, very handy. And that's practically the only source outside of conducting a time and motion study uh, to get that data very reliably. Uh, the kind of team we have deployed, it's, it's a large larger size team that, that we have deployed here. One is uh, you need to have people who understand the business. So there is somebody on our team who understands IT operations, who has, who has done a lot of work in this area. Uh, then we have a group of people uh, that consists of people who are good at pure data manipulation, data extraction, data manipulation, uh, using the kinds of tools that I talked about. Uh, we, have some, uh, we have someone who's um, what is referred to as a data scientist in the big data world, so someone who knows uh, different algorithms that you could use for a given type of problem, uh, including statistical methods, techniques, and so on. So we have that individual. It's a team of roughly six people uh, who are uh, working fairly close to full time on it. Uh, so it's, it's a larger uh, size engagement. Uh, the overall coverage is about uh, 5,000 resources. So it's a, it's a big enough project that we, we need to deploy a group of people against it. 5,000? 5, 5,000 uh, IT infrastructure services people. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Valid. You showed us uh, that you work with many different data sources. So uh -huh. in the context, many data sources. And in the context of process mining, what was your main challenge to identify uh, cases, process instances over those different uh, sources? When I'm thinking for email sources, batch swiping and all that. Right, right. So uh, the, the, uh, this was an interesting client situation in that the client already had an effort underway to look at things like batch swipes and other types of digital footprint presence of employees. They had some of the work going on in that. Our big challenge was actually collecting the event log and process uh, related data. Uh, and the big challenge was to convince the client team 
that we needed a lot more granularity in the data than they initially shared with us. So when you asked for the, you know, I want to look at for these 500 people, everything they did over the last two months, I want to know when they touched it and so on. Uh, you know, you got one line per ticket saying, this incident opened on such and such a day, closed on such and such a day, this person closed it. We did not get data for who all had to touch it to get that completely resolved. So you had to pursue and, and get to that data eventually. And, and it took us a long time to get them to agree and understand that that was going to be useful and important. Um, and a lot of times it was about saying, give me data for 100 and I'll show you what I can do with it. Uh, and then, you know, uh, based on what I can show you, then give me the data for the remaining 100,000. You know, that, that, that was the approach we ended up uh, taking for that. So in, in, in many ways, uh, the event data, the detailed system logs are the pieces that uh, people are not convinced can actually be used in a meaningful way uh, and are hesitant to give because it is just a lot of effort sometimes. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Questions?